ان الحمد لله نحمده ونستعينه ونستغفره ونعوذ بالله من شرور انفسنا ومن سيئات اعمالنا indeed all praises due to allah we praise him we seek his aid and we ask his forgiveness and we seek the refuge of allah from our evil selves and we seek the refuge of allah from our actions man yahdihi allah fala mudilla la whom serve allah guides there is none who can misguide him wa man yudlil fala hadiya la and whom serve allah causes to be misguided then there is none who can guide him ashhadu an la ilaha illallah wahdahu la sharika la i bear witness that there is no deity worthy of worship except allah wahdahu la sharika la he is alone and he has no partners wa ashhadu anna muhammadan abduhu wa rasuluhu and i also bear witness that muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam is the slave and the final messenger of allah amma ba'd fa inna khayr al hadith kitab allah thereafter the best of speech it is the book of allah وخير الهدي هدي محمد صلى الله عليه وسلم and the best of guidance is the guidance of our prophet muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam wa sharr al umur muhdathatuh the most evil of affairs are those matters which have been newly innovated into our religion fa inna kull muhdathatin bid'ah indeed every newly innovated matter is a bid'ah wa kull bid'atin dalala and every bid'ah is misguidance wa kull dalalatin fi an-nar and every misguidance is in the fire يا ايها الذين امنوا اتقوا الله حق تقاته ولا تموتن الا وانتم مسلمون او يو بليف في الله از يو تو بي فيرد اند دو نوت داي اكسبت ان ا ستيت اوف بين مسلمز يا ايها الذين امنوا اتقوا الله وقولوا قولا سديدا او يو بليف في الله اند اونلي سي ا ورد اوف تروث يصلح لكم اعمالكم هي ريكتيفاي فور يو يور فيس ويغفر لكم ذنوبكم ان هي ويل فورغيف فور يو يور سينز وَمَن يُطِعِ اللَّهَ وَرَسُولَهُ and whom so is obedient to Allah and his messenger فَقَدْ فَازَ فَوْزًا عَظِيمًا indeed he has achieved a great success أَحِبَّتِي فِي اللَّهِ my beloved brothers and sisters in Islam the topic of today's lecture or this series is regard is regarding a great event which will occur event an event or an occurrence or a reality which is actual something which is certain and cannot be disbelieved in something which is mentioned in the quran in many places over and over again that is al maut the death or a person dying and the rules regarding the death of a muslim and the rules the rules regarding the janaiz the funeral prayers so despite this matter and this occurrence and this reality and this certainty i death and the fact that it has been mentioned in the quran over and over again and the fact that this matter i death al maut is something which occurs in front of our, our eyes to so many people yet despite all of this and the fact it has occurred in the quran in many places despite all of this many of the people are in ghafla regarding it i many of the people are negligent regarding al maut and many of the people are negligent in terms of preparing for the for for the death and that which becomes after death so death al maut this is the first step that a person takes towards the hereafter as a person dies as death approaches a person then he leaves this world and he goes on to his own qiyama either hour is established upon him and that is that the hour the saa it's of two types the saatul kubra the major hour and the saatul sughra the minor hour so the saatul kubra the major of hour or the major day of resurrection resurrection then this is towards the end of time when all of the signs will come as for as saatul sughra the minor hour then this is with the death of every person so as soon as per, as a person takes this step i death approaches him and comes upon him then he takes a first step towards his hereafter and he takes a first de- a step towards his accountability in front of allah jalla fil ula so al maut death this is the barrier between this world which is temporary and between the next world which is eternal and forever al maut death is a barrier between this world which is a world a world of a'mal a world of a world of actions and between 
the next world, world which is a world of al-jaza, recompense and reward and punishment. So every person who, prefer, who performed good deeds and believed in Allah and died upon Tawheed will be held accountable and rewarded and recompensed for his good deeds. And every single person who died upon disbelief, Nasallah salama wal afiyah, and did evil actions, then the hereafter he will be held accountable. And he will be punished and recompensed for his bad deeds. So in the hereafter, the door of al-hasanat, of righteous deeds, it closes. And there is no domain or there is no opportunity or chance for a person to increase in his good deeds. And also the door of bad deeds and evil deeds, it closes. And there is no chance or opportunity for a person to seek forgiveness from his evil deeds and to repent from his evil deeds. Rather, as I mentioned, every person for the good that he did will be rewarded. And every person for the evil that he performed will be punished. And yet, despite all of this, then most of the people are negligent regarding al maut regarding death. Despite the fact that we know that this is the only certain occurrence which will occur. So many of us, in fact all of us, we prepare ourselves for this, for this life and this worldly life. So we seek or acquire an education and we have a career or we work or we build up our businesses and we save money for marriage or for our children for the education of our children and we buy a house or two houses for ourselves and our children and at all of these affairs it's only probable that they will occur I maybe we will live long enough to have a career maybe uh, we will be given children so we buy houses for them or we save some money for them and yet the only thing which a person is certain and, uh, about and has yaqeen in i.e. death then for this people are negligent regarding it and it always amazes me how people discuss in great details matters like pensions and a public state pension and a private pension is it worth putting money into a private pension so that maybe when a person reaches 65, 70, 75 then he will have some money spare for that age to make his life easy for him and yet the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam said, أَكْثَرُ أَعْمَارِ هَذِي الْأُمَّةِ مَا بَيْنَ سِتِّينَ وَسَبْعِينَ That the majority of uh, lives of this ummah, the people of this ummah is between 60 and 70. And yet people discuss these pensions, public pensions, state pensions, private pensions, for when they reach 75 years old. And the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam has also already told us that most of, all, most of us will die between 60 and 70 years old. And yet, the certainty which will occur, i.e. moat, death, then people are negligent regarding it. And yet Allah said, Kullu nafsin dha'iqatul mawt. That every single person will taste death. So the righteous person, he will taste death. And the disbelieving, evil person, he will also taste death. And the prophet, and the prophets before him, and the messengers, all of them, death came to them. If, there's, if there was anybody who was to be excused from death, then it would have been the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. And yet Allah said to him, إِنَّكَ مَيِّتْ وَإِنَّهُمْ مَيِّتُونَ That indeed you will die, and indeed they will also die. And those people who have a lot of uh, wealth, they are certain of this matter, i.e. death. And those people who are in poverty, then they are certain of this matter, i.e. death. Those people who live in poor houses, they are certain of this matter, death. And those people who live in security, in castles and forts, which are fortified, are also certain of this matter, al-mawt, death. أَيْنَمَا تَكُونُوا يُدْرِكُمُ الْمَوْتِ وَلَوْ كُنْتُمْ فِي بُرُوجٍ مُشَيَّدًا Wherever you may be, then death will come to you even if you are in Buruj Mushayyada, i.e. castles and forts which are secure and fortified. And if you look at the state that we live in, 
if you look at the people that we live around, if you look at the way that the technology is going, then the one thing that they are trying to find a cure for is old age and eternal life. And if they could find a cure for this, then this will be profitable for them, as is the world. And this isn't something that people have come with now. Rather, this is something which shaitan came and he tried to deceive our father Adam alayhi salam and our mother Hawa alayhi salam. He came to them with this deception or with this, uh, with this deception. Tried to, trying to make them believe that they will live forever. He said, مَا نَهَاكُمَا رَبُّكُمَا عَنْ هَذِهِ shajara." That your Lord, He has not prevented you or forbidden from you eating from this tree إِلَّا أَن تَكُونَ مَلَكَيْنَ Except that if you eat from this tree, you will be from the angels أَوْ تَكُونَ مِنَ الْخَالِدِينَ Or if you eat from this tree, you will be people of eternal life. And is it possible? Is it possible that the kuffar will ever discover a cure or a medicine which will solve the problem of death or make people live eternal life, it's not possible. Because Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has already told us this. And this is the sunnah of Allah. This is the way of Allah. This is the nature which Allah has made people upon. That every single person, every single human, he will pass, he will pass by and he will pass away and death will come to him. وَمَا جَعَلْنَا لِبَشَرٍ مِنْ قَبْلِكَ الْخُلْدِ we did not, we never made eternity for a single person who came before you. And he was talking to the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. That eternity was never made, an eternal life was never given to anybody who came before you. أَفَإِمْ مِتَّ فَهُمُ الْخَالِدُونَ If you die, will they live forever? كُلُّ نَفْسٍ ذَائِقَةُ الْمَوْتِ And then Allah said, rather all, everybody, every soul will taste death. So this death is a certainty that will come to the people. And we're not in need of knowing or being reminded of this certainty that death will come to us. Because everybody sees this. The believer sees this and the disbeliever sees this. However, who is the person who takes a lesson from the death of other people? Who is the person who takes an admonition from the death of the other people? or from the funerals of other people, and from the objectives of funerals and objectives of visiting the graveyards, is that it reminds you of the hereafter. And the Prophet ﷺ, he mentioned, كُنْتُ نَهَيْتُكُمْ عَنِ القبور. I used to forbid you from visiting the graves. Visiting the graves for the Muslims was forbidden in the beginning of the Sharia. فَزُورُوهَا so now go and visit them. فَإِنَّهَا تُذَكِّرُكُمْ عَنِ الْآخِرَةِ For indeed they remind you of the hereafter. So one of the, one of the objectives of attending funerals and following the funeral procession and visiting the graveyards is that it's a reminder and an admonition for the hereafter, for your own death. Yet who is the person who prepares for it? Or who is the person who seeks an admonition or takes a lesson and a reminder from the death of the other people. So the question here is, or the important matter here is, al-isti'dad lil-mawt. Preparing yourselves for al-mawt, for death. And al-isti'dad, the preparation for death, it is of two types. Firstly, a person making isti'dad, a person preparing himself or herself for death in terms of righteous actions and believing in Allah, having iman, dying upon a tawheed and dying upon al-Islam. A person preparing himself or herself for the hereafter. Ya ayyuhal ladhina amanu attaqullah, O you who believe, fear Allah, haqqa tuqatih, as he ought to be feared, وَلَا تَمُوتُنَّ إِلَّا وَأَنْتُمْ مُسْلِمُونَ And do not die except in a state of being Muslims. So this is the first type of isti'dad, first type of preparation throughout your life in terms of seeking knowledge, 
and doing righteous actions and then giving da'wah to the people to this knowledge and these righteous actions. And the second type of isti'dad or the second type of preparation is in knowing how to die. Are you preparing yourself in the correct Islamic manner of dying and how we interact with death in terms of relatives, families, funerals, illnesses, final words and so on and so forth. And from the beautiful things that is mentioned regarding Sheikh Muhammad Nasruddin al-Albani rahimullah and he is the author of the book that we'll be referring to in Arabic called Ahkam al Janais, the rulings of funerals. That when he passed away, and Shaykh ibn Uthameen rahimullah, he wanted to condo- give condolences and comfort his family, and he rang the family of Shaykh al Albani rahimullah. He said, Inna hayatahu kanat ala sunnah. That his living, all of it was according to the sunnah. Wa inna mawtahu kanat ala sunnah. And even his death was according to the sunnah. So the Muslim has to make sure that not only is his living, his life and his worldly life according to the sunnah of the Prophet ﷺ, but also that his death, his dying, and that which he leaves behind and his legacy is also according to the sunnah of the Prophet ﷺ. So therefore the question or the reminder is in preparing for death, preparing yourself, your children, your families for the inevitable certainty, i.e. al mouth death. And therefore it's appropriate that every single Muslim, that his main concern in life is regarding the hereafter. His main concern. I don't say that this is his only concern. And that a person should totally forget this world. That a person doesn't work. And he doesn't earn money. He doesn't have a living. He doesn't educate himself. And he just sits in the masjid and he prepares for the hereafter. No. And this is not according to the revelation that we find in the Qur'an and the Sunnah of the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. Allah Jalla fil Ula said, وَلَا تَنْسَى نَصِيبَكَ مِنَ الدُّنْيَا Do not forget your portion from this world, from the worldly life. And the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam said, إِنَّ Allah, Indeed Allah, يحب, he loves al abd al mu'min al taqi al muhtarif indeed allah loves a slave who is a believer and he has a taqwa he has piety he is pious and he is muhtarif i somebody who has a skill or a living or a career or a trade and if you look into the stories of the sahaba ridwanullah alayhim the companions of the prophet sallallahu alayhi wasallam and they paid the most attention to the hereafter then they were not people who used to sit and just think about the hereafter and do nothing from this world. Rather, Umar radiallahu anhu himself, as some of you will know, he had a companion from the Ansar. And one and both of them had a garden or a farm that they would work in. And one day his companion would go to the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wasallam whilst Umar radiallahu anhu worked. And he cultivated the farm or the land. And the companion, the, the Ansari, he would go to the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wasallam and sit with him, benefit from him, take a hadith from the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wasallam and learn from him. And then he would come back to Umar and Umar radiallahu anhu would, would learn from him. And then the following day, the Ansari, the friend of Umar radiallahu anhu, he would work on the farm and he would stay behind. And then Umar radiallahu anhu would go to the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wasallam and sit and learn and take a hadith and revelation from the Prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam. And like this, the other uh, uh, companions, ashaba of the Prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam. And he said regarding the salaf, and when I say salaf, I am referring to the pious and great imams of the previous generations from the Sahaba and the Tabi'een and the Atba Tabi'een, from the likes of Al-Imam Abu Hanifa Rahimullah, and Imam Al-Shafi'i and Malik and Ahmed ibn Hanbal Rahimullah and those who came after them, that they used to say that at the time of the Salaf, when a person reached 40 years old, then he would turn his attention to the hereafter. 
and doing righteous deeds for the hereafter when he reached 40 years of age. This doesn't mean that everything before 40 years of age was spent in disobedience to Allah. Rather, even before the 40 years of age, it was spent in the obedience of Allah and seeking knowledge and doing righteous actions. However, as 40 came to them, then they to turn towards remembering and paying more attention to the hereafter, Yawm Al-Akhir. And Ibn al-Jawzi, rahimullah, he mentions, فَيَنْبَغِي لَهُ That it is appropriate for, for a Muslim, إِذَا بَلَغَ الْأَرْبَعِينَ That when he reaches 40 years of age, يَكُونَ جُلَّ هِمَّتِهِ That the majority of his ambition and his hopes should be التزود في الآخرة in increasing his provisions for the hereafter. And many of the brothers here, even the younger brothers, have reached 30, 32, 35, 38, and or 40 or even older than 40 years old. And these are what we consider being as being the younger brothers. And yeah, when this age came, then the Salaf, they would start turning away from this life and turning towards the hereafter. And from the strange occurrences that I heard, that somebody told me is a person living in this country and he was 65 or 70 years old and he had just taken out a mortgage which is based upon interest, a Muslim of course, took out a mortgage based upon interest for 100,000 pounds to buy another house. 65, 70 years old. And he's, a ta- he's taking an interest-based mortgage inviting the wrath and the curse of Allah Jalla fil Ula in taking mortgage worth 100,000 pounds to live in a house. And he has reached 65 or 70 years old. And yet the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa has already told him أَكْثَرُ أَعْمَارِ هَذِي الْأُمَّةِ مَا بَيْنَ سِتِّينَ وَسَبْعِينَ That the majority of the lives of this ummah is between 60 years and 70 years old. And Allah says يَا أَيُّهَا الَّذِينَ آمَنُوا O you who believe لَا تُلْهِكُمْ أَمْوَالُكُمْ وَلَا أَوْلَادُكُمْ عَنْ ذِكْرِ اللَّهِ Do not allow your wealth and your children to take you away or to deceive you from the remembrance of Allah. وَمَنْ يَفْعَلْ ذَلِكَ فَأُولَئِكَ هُمُ الْخَاسِرُونَ And whoever does this, then they are the one who are the losers. وَأَنْفِقُوا مِمَّا رَزَقْنَاكُمْ And give and donate from that which we have provided you with. مِنْ قَبْلِ أَنْ يَأْتِيَ أَحَدُكُمْ الموت. Before a day in which death comes to one of you. فَيَقُولُ رَبِّي And then he will say, O oh my Lord, لَوْ لَا أَخَّرْتَنِي إِلَىٰ أَجَلٍ قَرِيبٍ If only you take me back to a nearby time. Or if only you take me back to my life. فَأَصَّدَّقْ And then I will give in charity. وَأَكُمْ مِنَ الصَّالِحِينَ And then I will be from the righteous people. وَلَنْ يُؤَخِّرَ اللَّهُ نَفْسًا جَاءَ أَجَلُهَا And Allah will never return a soul back to the time when the prescribed time, i.e. death, has come to him. وَاللَّهُ خَبِيرٌ بِمَا تَعْمَلُونَ And Allah is all aware and all knowing and all informed of that which you used to do. So Muslims should attach importance or more importance to the hereafter than this worldly life. And I say this despite that we have ayat in the Quran and a hadith from the Prophet wasallam, also encouraging us to attach some importance to this life. So a person works and he helps others. He educates himself, his children. He benefits others. He benefits himself. This is the life of a Muslim. And yet in all of his life, his main concern is towards the hereafter. So consider that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala He has prescribed five daily prayers obligatory upon every single Muslim throughout the whole day. Meaning that every three or four hours or four or five hours in your daily routine when you are in school or when you are in a career when you are working then a prayer comes in. After every three, four or five hours a prayer comes in. And this prayer it is a reminder of the hereafter. That carry on and proceed with your daily life and earning your provisions and earning your bread which is halal but don't forget the hereafter and then a person goes back to his work or his career his business or his school and then a few hours later another prayer comes 
at dawn, midday, early evening, sunset, and late evening. All throughout this time, every, a prayer is obligatory upon every single Muslim. Reminding a person that don't forget the hereafter. Carry on with your worldly life, but don't forget the hereafter. And once a week, Jum'ah has been prescribed for all of the Muslims to come together and they leave their work. To remind them that carry on with your weekly routine of seeking your provisions and seeking your rizq and your, and your bread and your uh, living for your family, but don't forget the hereafter. And once every year, a zakah is ordained. That carry on accumulating this wealth for yourself and your family and serving the people, but don't forget the portion that is with, for the poor people and for the hereafter and for Al-Islam. And one month out of the 12 months, Ramadan comes in. Fasting is prescribed. And Allah reminds us through this action that carry on eating and drinking and living your lives and eating that which is halal and eating that which, and drinking that which is halal. But don't forget the hereafter. And don't forget your Islam. So we see that in all of our lives, at repeating periods of time, every day, every week, a month in a year, one day in a year, there is some reminder for the hereafter and for Islam and regarding your death. Allowing you to live in a halal way, but to remind you of the hereafter and to remind you of death. And the people, when it comes to death, they are of two types. When it comes to death, al maut then people are of two types. Those people who are pleased with the meeting of Allah, and Allah is pleased with their meeting, and then the other group of people who hate the meeting with Allah and therefore Allah hates the meeting with them. And these two types of people with regards to al maut with regards to death, they were mentioned in an authentic hadith of the Prophet wasallam, like this, these two types of people. Some of the companions, they didn't understand this categorization of the people concerning death. How can a person look forward to death and then Allah looks forward to his meeting. And one of the companions who questioned the Prophet وسلم, was our mother, Umm al Mu'minin, Aisha radiallahu anha. She said, Ya Rasulullah, O Messenger of Allah, Kulluna yakrah al maut. Every single one of us, we hate death, we detest death, or we dislike death. And this is something natural that nobody looks forward to the pains of death. And the Prophet ﷺ replied to her and said, La ya Aisha, no, O Aisha, laysa that. It is not that that I am referring to. And then he said, Al-abd al-salih, a righteous slave, O al-abd al-musaqim, or a practicing slave, meaning a slave or a Muslim who is practicing the religion of Allah. Inda sakarat al maut And he is amidst the pains of death. فَتَأْتِيهِ مَلَائِكَةُ Rahman, And then the angels of the Most Merciful, they come to him. فَتُبَشِّرُهُ بِرُوحٍ So they give him the glad tidings of the ruh. وَرَيْحَانٍ and Rayhan, Meaning either Jannah or things which are pleasant and pleasant uh, smells. وَرَبٍ رَاضٍ And a Lord who is pleased with him. غَيْرُ غَضْبَانٍ And a Lord who is not angry with him. فَيَفْرَحُ بِاللِّقَاءِ اللَّهِ So then this righteous slave, he becomes happy with the meeting of Allah. He looks forward to the meeting with Allah. فَيَفْرَحَ اللَّهُ بِاللِّقَائِهِ And then Allah, he becomes happy and he looks forward to meeting with him. وَأَمَّا الْعَبْدَ الْعَاصِ and as for the slave who is disobedient, in the sakarat al then he is also in the pains of death. فَتَأْتِي مَلَائِكَةُ Rahman, And the angels of the Most Merciful, the angels of Allah, they come to him. فَتُبَشِّرْهُ, فتبشره بِسَقَطٍ وَسَخَرٍ وَسَخَطٍ وَعَذَابِ اللَّهِ And then they give him the news of the displeasure and the wrath and the punishment of Allah. فَيَكْرَهُ لِقَاءَ اللَّهِ and that this person, he despises and he hates and he detests the meeting of Allah. فَيَكْرَهُ اللَّهُ لِقَاءَهُ And then Allah, he hates and he detests and he despises his meeting. 
So we want to be in a state in which we are prepared for death. I.e. when death comes to us, we are in, for example, the state of al-wudu. Who is the person who will be in a state of wudu? A person who always completes his prayers. So when death comes to us, then we are in this state of being in wudu. Or we want to die, and we die in the masjid. Who are the people who will die in the masjid? Those people who establish their prayers in, with congregation in the masajid. We want to be prepared so that we, when we die, we die reciting the Qur'an. Or we die seeking, in seeking knowledge. Or doing righteous actions. And some people, and we ask Allah to save us, they die upon disbelief, upon kufr. Or they die upon disobedience to Allah. So how many Muslims have you heard of and they have died from drugs or alcohol or listen to music in their cars or died accompanying the people who are not righteous. So the Muslim who wants to prepare for the hereafter and prepare for his death, he does so in keeping with the righteous people, always being in the masajid, living his life in a halal manner but always remembering the hereafter. And also, people of two types when it comes to death. Another categorization of people when it comes to death. And the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam in the hadith of Abi Huraira radiallahu anhu, that when a funeral procession was passing by him, he said, Mustarihun o mustarahun min. That this person is either at peace and at rest, or this person is a person who other people are, in, are from, uh, at rest from or in peace from. And when the companions, they asked the Prophet wasallam regarding this categorization, the Prophet wasallam said, Al-abd, al-mu'min, yastarihu min nasab dunya That the slave who is a believer, his death is a respite or peace or relaxation from the turmoils and the difficulties of this world. Abdul Fajir, and as for the slave who is transgressing or disobedient, فَيَسْتَرِيحُ مِنْهُ النَّاسِ Then the people, they take respite from his death. Because he doesn't harm them, his harm, his action, his speech, it doesn't reach him. Balad, And the countries of the earth, it takes respite and peace from this person passing away. shajar. And even the trees, they take respite and peace and relax from this person passing away. Waddawab. And even the animals and the cattle, then they take respite and rest and peace from this person who is disobedient and transgressing and he passes away. And the Prophet ﷺ mentioned, Inna ahabban nas, indeed the most beloved of people to Allah, Man yurja khayruhu wa yu'man sharruh is a person whose goodness is hoped for and his evil or his harm people fa- feel safe from. Either people, when they live and they interact with this person, then they're always benefiting from him in some good way. And any harm or evil that he might have, they feel safe from this. They feel safe from his tongue and from his hands and his actions. Wa sharrun nas and the most evil of people with Allah, man la yurja khayru, is a person whose goodness is neither hoped for, wala yu'man sharru, and neither is his, is his evil or his harm felt safe from. And the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam said, sharrun nas, the most evil of people, is a person, man tarakahu an nas ittiqa'a fahshi, is a person who the people abandon and they leave alone and they stay away from him because they fear his actions and his lewd speech uh, and his uh, bad and evil lewd actions. So this is an example of a Muslim who is prepared for the hereafter. That when he leaves this world, he leaves behind a legacy. That even the people, they mention him with goodness. And all of you have been present in sittings or funerals where a particular elder has passed away and the people say this man was such a good person he used to always clean to the, clean the masjid or come to the masjid or used to help the people and people remember his goodness and they ne- neglect to leave, leave off any uh, harm that might have occurred from him or any deficiencies that he had and pleasing the people or wanting the people to think good about you 
is not something which, is, uh, which makes your sincerity deficient. It's good for a person that he wants the people to think good about him. So he helps them and he shows goodness to them and he prevents any harm reaching them. But his intention is doing, in doing this is that he wants to please Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So this doesn't mean that a person says that I don't want to please the people. I don't, want, I don't care what the people say about me. Rather a person he wants to please Allah and he wants to please Allah by people being happy. Of course, in the limits of the Sharia. So a person doesn't obey the people in disobedience to Allah. A person doesn't give pleasure to the people with the displeasure of Allah. But there's nothing wrong with a person wanting to leave a legacy of goodness behind so that people, they make dua for him or they remember his goodness and they leave off or they forget his, uh, any harm that might have come from him. And there are a number of matters when it comes to the reality of death or a number of rulings when it comes to the reality of death. Number one I mentioned in terms of al-isti'dad, preparation, and how a person lives his daily life. Number two, the types of people when it comes to death. I either people who are at peace, uh, who are at peace and the death is a relaxation or a respite for them, or a group of people whose death the people they take respite from and the earth takes respite from and even the trees and death it takes respite from. And then the next matter or the next ruling when it comes to the reality of death is a person claiming that he is ready for death. Are you a person being confident that he has enough good deeds that he is now ready for death? And this only occurs due to either arrogance or lack of iman or even greater presence of hypocrisy in the heart of a person. So the true believer, he never believes that he's ready for death. And neither does he ever feel safe from the wrath and the punishment of Allah Jalla fil Ula. And Imam al Hassan al Basri rahimullah he said, Al Mu'min, the true believer, la yajma'u bain al ihsani wa shafaqa. That the true believer, he combines between doing good deeds and then being scared. Meaning he performs many good actions and yet he's scared that Allah does not accept these uh, actions from him. Wa in al munafiq, and as for the hypocrite, fa innahu yajma'u, then he combines between Isa'atan, between doing evil deeds and har harming people, wa amana, and between feeling safe from the punishment of Allah. So the true believer, as Ibn al-Qayyim rahimullah mentions, he places his good deeds behind him. He never looks towards his good deeds. And as for his acts of disobedience and his evil deeds, then they are in front of his eyes and he always looks towards them. Not that a person magnifies his good deeds and he belittles his evil deeds. So the true believer does not look at the type of disobedience or the type of sin. Is it a major sin or is it only a minor sin? Rather, he looks to the greatness of the person, his, uh, the greatness of the being or the one he is disobeying. Ay Allah, Jalla fil Ula. And as I mentioned, a person should always fear disbelief upon himself and fear hypocrisy upon himself. Consider the dua, the supplication of Ibrahim alayhi salam, the Prophet Ibrahim, and he's Khalil al-Rahman, the most beloved friend of al-Rahman. And he's the Imam of the people of at tawheed And yet his dua, dua was, Allahumma jnabni wa baniya an na'budu al-asnam. O oh my Lord, O oh, oh Allah, save me and my children from worshipping idols. So how many of us ever make this dua? Oh Allah, save me and from my children from ever worshipping idols. And yet Khalil al-Rahman, Imam al muwahidin Abu al-Anbiya, the father of the prophets, the father of the Arabs, he makes this dua and he's a beloved friend of Ar-Rahman that oh Allah, save me and my children from worshipping idols. Ibn Abi Mulaika, rahimullah, he narrates in Sahih Bukhari, Adraktu, I met 30 from the companions of the Prophet. The companions of the Prophet. 
Every single one of them and he fears hypocrisy upon himself. Who? The companions of the Prophet And how many of us ever make this dua? Oh Allah, inna na'udhu bika min nifaq Oh Allah, save us and we seek refuge from al-nifaq. From hypocrisy. One of the brothers who was living in Britain and he told me this himself and he, he lives in Saudi Arabia now. He said, there was a time in my life that when I was living in Britain, I was amongst a particular group of people and we used to think that we are the people of Jannah. We used to consider ourselves that we are the people of Jannah. We are Ahl Hadith, the people of Hadith. We are the Salafis. We are the Ahl Sunnah. We are the ones who have been saved. We are the victorious saved. We are the people of Al Jannah. And everybody else is people from the people of Jahannam. And yet, the companions, he met 30 of them, every single one he fears nifaq upon himself. When the Prophet wasallam, he revealed the names of the hypocrites to Hudayfa ibn al-Yaman radiallahu anhu, the first person to come to Hudayfa ibn al-Yaman radiallahu anhu was Umar radiallahu anhu, asking him, did the Prophet wasallam mention my name from being amongst the hypocrites? Umar radiallahu anhu. And he is al-Farooq. The one whom Allah used to use as a distinction between truth and falsehood. The one who when he walked, then the shayateen, they would walk from the other side. And yet when the Prophet ﷺ revealed the names of the hypocrites in secrecy to Hudayfa ibn Yaman, the first person to approach him was Al-Farooq. Did the Prophet ﷺ mention my name amongst the hypocrites? And yet he was from one of the ten people, or from amongst the foremost of the ten people, who were given the glad tidings and the promise that he was from the people of Jannah, from the people of paradise. So it's not correct for a believer to ever be arrogant or forget his weaknesses or consider himself better and more lofty than all of the other Muslims and consider himself from the saved sect or the victorious group. Rather, he takes his example from the companions, always fearing kufr, disbelief and nifaq and shirk upon himself and also from the rulings of death in terms of pre preparing for death and the reality, of, the reality of death is that a Muslim should frequently remember and remind each other regarding death and by doing so a person's life remains in balance and the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wasallam he termed death as being hadim al Something which destroys the desires. If you ever have desires and you want to destroy those desires, then remember death or go visit the graveyards. The Prophet ﷺ said, "Akthiru min dhikri hadim Be frequent in your remembrance of the destroyer of desires, al maut i death. فَإِنَّهُ لَمْ يَذْكُرْهُ أَحَدٌ فِي ذِيقٍ مِنَ الْعِيشَةِ أَوْ مِنَ الْعِيشِ إِلَّا وَسَعَهُ عَلَيْهِ." Because whenever a person who finds himself in difficulty when it comes to his life, if he remembers death, it will make things easy for him or it will make his mind will become at peace. Because he knows that even though he's in difficulty and poverty now, in the hereafter, by the permission of Allah, there is ease for him. وَلَا ذَكَرَهُ فِي سَعَةٍ And nobody remembers death when he's living in luxury and he's affluent. Except that the remembrance of death makes it difficult and restrictive upon him. Because he remembers that even though now I am living in luxuries and I have wealth now and I am affluent now, but in the hereafter it could be something else. So by being frequent in remembering al maut remembering death, a person's life always remains in balance. Neither does a person become too happy with his, rich, with his richness and his wealth, and neither does a person become despondent and too sad with his poverty and any, any difficulty that he has. And in any actions that we do, in terms of preparing for the hereafter and our funeral processions, then the first thing that we have to be aware of is following the ways of the disbelievers. That in our funerals, we don't follow the way of the disbelievers. Rather, our culture and our customs and our ways are different and independent and better than the ways of the disbelievers. And the Prophet ﷺ, he already prophesied 
That indeed you will follow the ways of those people who came before you, i.e. the Jews and the Christians. So even in the funeral processions and death, then people follow the way of the Jews and the Christians. And this is something that we have to be aware of and we have to stay away from. And also that person stays away from bid'at, innovations. I doing things or matters which the Prophet ﷺ did not do. And finally that a person, all of the actions he does in terms of preparing for death, they are done with al-ikhlas, with sincerity. وَمَا أُمِرُوا إِلَّا لِيَعْبُدُ اللَّهِ مُخْلِصًا لَهُ الدِّينِ And they were not ordered except that they worship Allah, making their religion sincerely for the sake of Allah. Meaning, when you go to a person's house to offer condolences, you don't do it because he came to your house, but because you want to please Allah. When a person passes away, you don't say, I'm not going to attend his funeral because he didn't attend my relative's funeral. Rather, you attend his funeral for the pleasure and seeking the pleasure of Allah, Jalla fil ula. So this is an introdu- introduction to the reality of death and some of the rulings in regards to the reality or the preparation of isti'dad al maut preparing yourselves for death. Now in the next coming lessons, the next coming weeks, then as mentioned, as advertised in the post, we're going to study the fiqh or the ahkam, the rulings of everything which is linked to death. From when a person comes ill, in his final illness, and when death or before death approaches him, to when he dies and how he prepares for it, and in terms of after his death, and how a person should be washed or wash others, and shrouded or shroud others, or be buried or bury others, and so on and so forth. All of this, by the permission of Allah, we're going to cover over the next coming uh, weeks and the next coming lessons every Friday by the permission of Allah. If Allah extends our lives. And the book that we're going to cover, and I think it would be beneficial for the brothers and sisters if you could buy this book, is the book in English, is this book which I'm holding, called Funerals, Regulations and Exhortations by Dr. Muhammad Al-Jibali. And this book in great detail, it covers all of the uh, chapters regarding death and all of the various issues regarding death. Each one mentioned with uh, authentic evidences from the Qur'an and the Sunnah of the Prophet wasallam, And it can also act as a manual uh, for a person regarding uh, funerals and when things occur. Because sometimes maybe we study something and then after a while we forget it. But if you have this book at home and we've been studying it together and you've annotated this book, when that time comes for a funeral or to shroud somebody, you can quickly turn to that chapter and just revise and go over the things that we have studied. And this book... Um, it's available in some of uh, it's available in the bookshops and online. Uh, one of the bookshops in Blackburn, I contacted them the other day, and they said that they sell this book for I think twelve pounds or twelve ninety nine. If there are brothers who are interested in ordering this book for next week, um, and I have uh, a piece of paper here where brothers can leave their name uh, and their contact details and how many copies they want, and then the bookshop they said to me that if you tell us how many uh, people want this book, we can then order it for you. And you can take it for whoever wants. And you can give them money when it comes to taking the book. So if you want to buy the book, whether it's the brothers or the sisters upstairs, if you leave your name and your contact uh, n- number and address behind, then the, some of the brothers will be able to go and order these books for you. And then you can buy them and also the number of copies that you want. Uh, we'll end with that. Wallahu ta'ala alam wa sallallahu ala nabina wa sallam.